thank you for as soon as he said Tanner's teaching, you didn't just immediately get up and run out the door. Appreciate that. It's going to be fun. We'll have some time together. <clears throat> we have been studying the book of Acts together as, as a church. We've been in an origin story. Um, we've really just been asking the question, where did we come from? What is our origin story as a church? Where did this all begin? And um, that's kind of why we turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, in many ways, illustrates foundational attributes and rhythms of the early church and kind of shows us what of these attributes and rhythms should we see present in our church today? What should, what should we see there? So this is why we are studying the book of Acts and in our origin story. There's a museum called the National Museum of Corvettes. This is a pretty special place if you're a car lover, if you... Uh, like Corvettes, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful museum. In this museum, there is serial numbers one and two, very first Corvettes ever made. Very expensive Corvettes, irreplaceable Corvettes. Can't find them anywhere else in the world. And there's people that travel all over the world to come to this museum and walk through it to see the cars that's there, to see the memorabilia that's there, the cool things that they kind of have there, to see kind of the show that is this museum. Well, in 2014, this happened. A massive sinkhole opened up underneath this museum. And a lot of these irreplaceable, that one right there, breaks my heart. It saddens me to my core. That is ridiculous. All these irreplaceable cars fell into this sinkhole. And some of them actually had irreparable damage. Like, it couldn't be fixed. There's nothing that could be done about it. Why is this important that we study our origin story? Why is it important that we look through the book of Acts to learn what kind of rhythms that the early church had? Because it's our foundation as a church. Just like this museum, it doesn't matter what we do as a church, what kind of fancy things we have, what kind of events we host, what kind of programs we have. It all doesn't matter if we don't build ourselves on solid foundation. If we build ourselves on a faulty foundation, then disaster is sure to follow. This is why it's so important. As individuals, as believers, personally, we get our foundation from our understanding of who we are in Christ. This is where our foundation personally as followers of Jesus comes from. As the collective body of believers, the church, where we get our solid foundation comes from the early church. It comes from our understanding of what the church was designed to be. This is our solid foundation, our origin story. If there's a crack in our foundation, then there is a crisis at our core. I'll say that again because it's really important. If there's a crack in our foundation, then there is a crisis at our core. It's crucially important that we know who we are and we begin to build off of that foundation. We have to start there always. This is why we keep going back to Acts. If you've been around Colonial long enough, You've seen that we've studied Acts quite a bit. Why? Because it's so important. We're forgetful people. We need to go back and look at how does the early church operate? What were they doing? What are the things that we should see in our church today? So today we're going to study Acts 13 together. But before we kind of jump into that, I want to read something that I think will give us a really good kind of overview of what, when we study Acts, what can we hope to get out of this? Charles Swindoll points out this. He says, when we study the journeys of Paul in the book of Acts, we're not just reading the travel log of a man, we're observing the redemptive plan of God unfolding as he promised. Through the ministry of Saul of Tarsus, God's mission to reclaim his creation from the death grip of evil would move to its next stage. The plan of this mission was outlined in the Lord's promise at his ascension where he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Now this happens in three different stages. Here they are. Stage one, saturating Jerusalem with the gospel. Okay, this is where it all began for us. You have, you have this church that's in Jerusalem. It's saturated with the gospel. We see this happening in Acts 2 through 7. The second stage of this we've actually been studying and talking about here recently is witnessing in all Judea and Samaria, as we read about in Acts 8 through 12. And then the third stage of this is witnessing even to the remotest parts of the earth, which that's what we're going to kind of get into today, beginning in Acts 13. 
Now, Acts 13 uh, opens in Antioch, which is in Syria, and the church of Antioch becomes the mission church, right? So before you had the church of Antioch, you had the church in Jerusalem, which was the mother church. This is where it all began for us. These, these were people coming to Jesus, coming to know the good news of the gospel, and then you had this church in Antioch, which is the mission church. Jerusalem has been saturated with the gospel, and from there we read that the Holy Spirit began to call people to different places. Peter was sent to Judea, Philip was sent to Samaria, and now God has gotten a hold of Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the Apostle Paul. Now in this chapter, chapter 13, there's a transition that takes place that is anticipated by Jesus. Okay, He knew this was coming. And in a sense, is expected for every follower of Jesus, everybody, every one of you. If, you. if you claim to know Jesus, this is something that he expects of you. There's a natural uh, spiritual growth that takes place in a person as a believer. And I believe it starts with they become a saved person. This is, maybe some of you are familiar with this, where it would be in saved. This is maybe you trust Christ for the first time, and now you're taking on this new identity as you accept Jesus and are now being identified as a follower of him. You're saved. They're, they're saved. Then you move from being saved to a serving person. Begin to identify talents, gifts, abilities, things that you can offer, needs that you can meet, and you begin to do that in the context of a local church and in your community. You, be, you become a serving person. Then you move from there to what I would call a saturated person. Saturated person, what do I mean by this? As this person gathers in the body of believers regularly, similar to what we do, they are saturated, they are, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. They become more attuned to what the Holy Spirit is doing in their lives. They become more aware. They're saturated. Then they move from there to being a sent person, which means they, they obey the prompting, the leading, the guiding of the Holy Spirit, and they're sent out on mission. This is kind of the natural spiritual growth that takes place that is kind of expected by Jesus. So saved, serving, saturated, sent. And this is what we see in Acts 13 as we follow the Apostle Paul who up until this passage, we'll see here in just a moment, has been referred to as Saul, but he's going to be referred to as Paul for the first time. So Saul, Paul, same person. Also kind of interesting, uh, he's referred to Paul for the remainder of Acts, with the exception of when they talk about uh, his uh, conversion, when he becomes a follower of Jesus. So Paul has been saved, he's now serving, and we're going to see here that he is saturated or filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he is sent out. Okay, if you're listening, say, I am. We're going to jump into Acts 13 together. Here we go. Acts 13, 1. Among the prophets and teachers of the church of Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manaen, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. Okay, one of the first things that jump out to me is the diversity of people here. We tend to think about the first verse of any chapter as just the intro verse. And that is true, but I think there's actually quite a bit that we can pull out of the first verse here. This is a very interesting mix of people with a very diverse group of people. And we've learned over the last few weeks that Antioch, the city where this has taken place, the church in Antioch, the city, is a cosmopolitan city. Or really, they, uh, they have just incredibly different ethnicities and cultures that thrive and live within this community. And the list of prophets and teachers, these people who are listed here, um, this, this is an accurate representation of what the city looks like. This church looked very much like the city they served. I love this because what this shows us is that there is zero discrimination in the early church for le when, where leadership is concerned. Uh, zero. Zero. Whatsoever. You have people with very diverse backgrounds who come from all different places. You have people of different color. And this very diverse group of people collectively make up the leadership of this church in Antioch. They're sharing leadership roles together. How, how are they diverse? Let me, let me kind of highlight this for you. There's five people that are mentioned here. The first one is Barnabas, which actually, if you remember, a couple weeks ago, Lauren showed us that he was called Barnabas by the early church in Jerusalem which means son of encouragement. Barnabas was actually originally from Cyprus, which we'll read later in the chapter, that this is the first place that Barnabas and Saul 
are sent out to. This is where mission, the mission kind of happens, first place that they're sent to. Second person is Simeon, who's called Niger. Niger means black. It's assumed that he was a black African, so uh, kind of uh, historians, theologians kind of all agree. That this probably means that he was a black African. Then it says Lucius from Cyrene, and the next person's called Menaean. And it's kind of cool here. As, as a descriptor of Menaean, we read the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas. And uh, I think it's, uh, that's, that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool, what it, that descriptor that it says there. And then, of course, we see Saul is the next person that's highlighted there. Now, Menaean, I want to highlight Menaean here because Menaean is actually pretty interesting. Uh, it says here he was the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas. The wording for this is actually the Greek word syntropos, syntropos, which means brought up with. Um, this is actually a name that was given to uh, boys who were the same age as a prince in the royal court. These boys would be brought to the royal court and they were to be raised with or kind of companions of the, these princes. And this is the name that they would give them is syntropos. Um, it actually translates to foster brother, so it's kind of cool here because what this is actually saying in verse 1 is that Menaean, this brief little descriptor that's in parentheses here, is saying Menaean was actually family in some way to King Herod uh, in some way. Um, and so I want to connect some dots here. Why, why, do I, why do I mention this? Why am I talking about Herod Antipas? The Herod that's mentioned here is the same Herod that murdered John the Baptist, and the same Herod that Jesus stood trial in front of before his crucifixion. Menaean was brought up with him, raised with him. They were friends. They were family in some way. These guys took wildly different approaches, right? You have King Herod who is in some ways responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. And then you have Menaean who is one of the key leaders of the church of Jesus in Antioch. The power of a decision, right? I hope that this helps us paint just a clear picture of just how different, the different perspectives that these guys would have had, different points of view that these guys would have had as they're doing this. And I think this is a testament to what happens when we are chasing after a life like Jesus. What do we see in Acts 13? Jesus unites him not only to himself, but also to each other. We all have our own story, our God-given purpose. But the reality is that when we come to know Jesus, when we accept that, we increasingly pattern ourselves after the life of Jesus, and he unites us, not just to himself, but to those around us, no matter where you come from. He unites us together. This very thing right here is, is really the heart behind Colonial's mission statement, which I'll remind you is this. Colonial Church exists to make disciples who unite Wichita Falls and impact the world. It's what we're all about. We recognize that when we pursue Jesus together, he unites us, all of us, together. It's the recognition. We pursue him alongside one another. He unites us both to himself and to others. And we aren't carrying the identities of our past. We're not even carrying the identities that our parents gave us. We are carrying now, each of us, the identity of Jesus. Galatians 3 says this, And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I think if we can hold on to this truth as believers, it will radically change what God can accomplish in our city and in our world. Radically change that. If we can understand, it doesn't matter what your point of view is on this, or that, or, or what you might think about this topic or the other topic, it doesn't matter your history, your past, the things that you bring. If we can understand that he unites us all together, it's radically going to change what God can do through his church in our community here in Wichita Falls and across the world. I think this is something we need to really hold on to and focus on as we pursue our faith journey. Verse 2 says this, One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting... The Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. Okay, something that is worth highlighting here is the idea that these guys were worshiping the Lord and their worship, and in their worship, the Holy Spirit spoke. Okay, I'm the worship guy here, right? I've been doing this for quite a while. You knew if I was going to have a conversation, it was somewhere in there, worship was going to come up. 
I'm passionate about it. I love it. This speaks to my soul, so I want to highlight this. I want to go back, and I want to read here. It says, one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting. They were worshiping the Lord and fasting. The word translated worshiping here is the Greek word letur geo, which is a really hard word to pronounce. I had to YouTube it to figure out how to say that word. No shame in my game. Letur geo, which literally means ministering. Okay? This is where we get our word liturgy, which is practice of the people. It's the rhythms that we, 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 we use all the time. These guys were worshiping, and they were ministering to the Lord. It's an interesting concept. Letur geo is a word that was used to describe the service of priests in the temple, where they would have prayers of thanksgiving, they would offer up incense. All of those specific things are liturgical works, liturgical elements, that are solely focused on God and nothing else. No matter what they brought into that place with them, it's solely focused on God. This is what they were doing. They were ministering to the Lord. And in our context today, most likely, verse 2 here would be talking about something like this, a gathering like this where we get together and we worship God through prayer and through singing and through studying the word and through giving. This is what, this is what that would kind of look like, would be right here. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever had someone say or do something, maybe say something to you or do something for you, and you just thought, man, that really blessed me? Like they spoke right to your soul, or maybe they've done something for you that met a, a real need, and you just thought, that was such a blessing, that was a gift to me. When we gather together and we worship, this is God looking down at us and saying, man, that really blesses me. That really speaks to me. That really blesses me. And I think if we can, if we can look at our worship in that way, when we gather together and we sing and we praise God, if we can have this perspective of worship, it will change the way we worship. It will change the, the intentionality that we give to our worship. This is important. And I want to be clear about it. Worship is not just this time right here. When you walk out those doors today, your worship doesn't end, right? Worship is something you bring in with you here in this gathering. Worship is in every aspect of your life. It's how you treat your spouse. It's how you treat your coworkers. It's how you live your life like this, open-handed, sacrificially giving to those around you. That is worship. And worship comes from this true sense of discipleship. This is, this is what happens when you worship God. When you pursue this spiritual growth, this discipleship, true worship kind of follows. And true worship will always lead to a life of Jesus. I think if we can think of our worship as, that really blesses me. God's saying that really blesses me. It will change the way we worship. Okay. They were worshiping the Lord and they were fasting. And as they were so preoccupied with God and nothing else, that's when the Spirit spoke to them. I think the order in which we see things happen here is actually really important as well. They were worshiping the Lord, and then the Holy Spirit spoke. See, it comes when we're so, when we're so caught up in blessing God and worshiping God. That's when mission comes. That's when the to-do happens. In these moments when we are awakened to the Spirit, we are called into our kingdom purpose. I want to remind you of something in Acts 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what else do we see? What do we see in Acts 13? Worship comes before mission. Worship, mission. How many of us start with the what instead of the who? We ask questions like, what, what, am, what am I supposed to do? What, what do you want from me? What's my purpose? But I think the question we should be asking is, who should we become? Who should we be like? That's worship. It's asking that question. Again, I'll say, true worship of the Lord will always lead us to a life of Jesus. One day as these men were fasting, worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work 
to which I have called them. Verse 2 goes right in line with a radical minimum we have here at Colonial where we ask two questions every day. This is listening intently. We ask two questions every day. What is God saying and what should I do about it? Pretty simple. This is worship. Verse 2 begins with worshiping the Lord and fasting and the Holy Spirit speaks. God, what are you saying to me today? And what do you want me to do about it? To ask the question, God, what do, you want me to, what do you want to say to me today, is to remove focus on anything else and totally be focused on what God is saying, an act of worship. What do you want me to do about it? Mission. Moving into verse 3, we see the Apostle Paul's first missionary journey take place. Remember I said that the church of Antioch becomes the mission church. Before you had the church in Jerusalem, the mother church, so to speak, then you had this mission church. So verse 3 says, after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So verse 3 is kind of cool. Uh, this is the moment when these guys affirmed what the Holy Spirit was saying. And when it says, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way, this is what they were doing. This is what was happening. This was them saying, yes, we see what God is doing in the lives of Barnabas and Saul, and we all about it. We're all about it. We see this happening, we agree, we affirm, we're all about it. There's nothing, I want to say this, there's nothing magic in the laying of hands. The only thing in hands is germs, okay? This wasn't a magic kind of thing that, that was happening. What was happening? This was a commissioning. This was a sending. This was an alignment. This was an opportunity, a display of unity for these guys. It was a sending off ceremony, an act of blessing. This was the church saying, we have heard the Lord saying this, and we are sending these guys off as an extension of us to do the work that God has put before them. Something else worth mentioning here, I think, this was a new and growing church in Antioch that these men were leading. Brand new church. I had been in church work, so to speak, for 10 years. I have never met a time in my life where I haven't had a lot to do. These guys, this is a brand new church starting up. There's some key leaders in this brand new church. It's not like they were sitting around going, oh, God, I'm so bored. Can you please give us something to do? No. <laughs> there was plenty to do at this church. There's plenty of work. And when God asked this church of Antioch to release two of their key leaders into missions, without hesitation, yes. Yes, we will do that. We will send these guys off. This is how important the obedience to the call, the prompting, the leading of the Holy Spirit was to the early church. Without hesitation, it's part of their leadership. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. That's Galatians 5, 24 through 25. This is what's happening here in verse 3, a relentless obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit. How many of us are willing to do that in our lives? I want to ask that question boldly because I can't answer it honestly for me. I don't know. I have a lot that I'm doing, a lot that I'm responsible for, and if, if the Holy Spirit called me to do something else, I'm not so sure I'm ready to say yes. How many of us have something in our life that represents a level of importance? And if the Spirit was calling that person to be removed from that, how many of us would go, yep, yeah, yep, we see that, send them on their way, especially if they're key in what we're doing. I, I don't know about that. But this is what we see in the early church, a relentless obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Tied all together, I think, is the end of verse 2 all the way through the beginning of verse 4. These verses really illustrate a very important message to us. When you put them together like this, there's an important message I think we can get from this. Verse 4 says this, So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Yes, in the verse previously it says they laid their hands and they sent them on their way. Yes, but this illustrates for, here, for us here that the Holy Spirit is sending them. That they're sent out by the Holy Spirit. What do we see in Acts 13? It's the Holy Spirit that sends us. It's the Holy Spirit. Verse 2, 3, and 4 are bringing us to this point. They're bringing us to this resolve. Yes, there are some amazing lessons we can learn from each of these verses individually, but when you put them together like this, what you see there is that the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to lead us. 
is to send us. And that's important for us to know as Christ followers, to, to have this relentless obedience to the call of the Spirit, to be so saturated by the gospel that we can answer that and respond accordingly. John 14 says this, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. It's the Spirit that leads us, and it's the Spirit that sends us. As we continue reading, uh, the second part of verse 4 and all of verse 5 give us a plan. Okay, so they know they're going to be sent out. They know that they've been called by the Spirit. Now what? Well, they have a plan. And this is what we can see in verse 4 and 5 here. It says, They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, at the beginning of our conversation, when we were talking about Barnabas. Barnabas was actually from Cyprus. We talked about that. This is the first place they're being sent to, is Cyprus. Now, two things are very interesting here to me uh, in these verses. First is they began in a place that was familiar. Okay, they were sent to a place that was familiar. It's just Barnabas' hometown. He knows the people. He knows the culture. He knows the nightlife. He knows what to expect from these people. He's sent to a place that's familiar. And I think often we can believe that when the Spirit calls us, it's going to be to some far-off place that we're not familiar with, that we're going to have to kind of navigate the waters when we get there and see, I don't know, maybe he wants us to do something. But I think more often than not, the Spirit is leading us and calling us to recognize that there is incredible work for us to do right where we are the place that we live, the place we work, the place we go to school, right here in our context, the place that we're familiar with. Maybe, yes, God does often call people to far off places, but I think more often than not, we see this being represented in our daily lives, this call of recognizing there's work to be done right here where we're placed. So they began in a place that was familiar The second thing is when they got to Cyprus, where did they begin? What does it say here? It says they started in the synagogue. They started with believers, right? They were very intentional. They had a strategic plan of where they were going to go to begin their missional work. They started in a place where people would have been most likely ready to receive the good news of the gospel. I think that's important to note. They didn't go find somebody on a street corner somewhere. And say, hey, have you heard about Jesus? No, they they went where people were ripe. They were ready, where the the Spirit of the Lord has been working and and preparing them to receive the message that we have for them. It's pretty simple to be able to walk up to somebody who's ready for the conversation you're about to have. This is what they did. They started in the synagogue. They went to where some believers were and would have most likely been ready to receive what they had to say. This is where they started. And a few of our radical minimums come to mind with this one. Radical minimum number four is sharing boldly. That comes to mind. We we talk about we share our story or pray boldly over someone each week. This is why we celebrate video stories, the things that we just showed today. We believe that our story matters. And, And all wrapped up in our story is this representation of the gospel in our lives. What Jesus has done in our life. This is why it's important. We're going to share boldly our story and pray boldly over someone each week. These guys were sent out to preach the word of God, to share boldly the good news of God. So that was radical minimum number four. And another one that that pops up, it's kind of funny that we go to the early church and we start to see all these core values that we hold as a church. It's reassuring, it's reaffirming for me that this is the direction we're headed. Radical minimum number five, engaging purposefully. This is a core value. This is something we want to we want to have all of us doing every single time. We engage in a purposeful meal, drink, or activity with someone each week. These guys were engaged purposefully. They had a plan. They were very intentional with how they were going to do it, strategic in how they were going to do it, and who they were going to engage with. This is us, this is us here, engaging purposefully. How are you doing that in your life? 
These are the things that we're wrestling with that should be present in our church today. The last part of verse 5 is definitely worth talking about. And because it's so short, we can easily just move right on past it. We can kind of just go, oh, that's a nice little add-on here. Uh, We're going to move on past. It says this, John Mark went with them as their assistant. Acts 13, 5. Why is it important we stop and we take note of this? This is discipleship happening right in front of our eyes. This is discipleship. We like to think that discipleship is some convoluted, very difficult thing to achieve. We like to fantasize uh, discipleship, romanticize discipleship. And we have lots of energy and resources given to tools to be able to intentionally make disciples. And those, those are actually really good things. We should have them. We need them. So don't mishear me when I say this. But more often than not, discipleship is actually easier than that. I think we could think about discipleship as this. Bring someone along while you are doing what you're doing. Bring someone along while you're doing what you're doing. When you go to work or when you are engaged in a conversation in in your home, what does it look like to be people who don't just show the world our scars, this is what I've come through, but show people, this is, these are the wounds I'm facing right now. This is my real life. And here's a freebie for you. Your life will be more effective in making disciples if we can recognize it's not about our Instagram reel. It's about our real, full of hardship life. When we can open up our lives, when we can be vulnerable and real with people, this is where discipleship happens. Okay, sorry. Talked about that a little too long. Bring someone along while you're doing what you're doing. In everything that Paul and Barnabas were doing here, they took someone along. They were discipling someone. This is radical minimum number two for us, training deliberately. Uh, We learn from someone and invest in someone about following Jesus. This is central to who we are as people. The work that God has put before us is too important to leave to only us. We are going to die someday. We need to be investing in someone. And all at the same time, we don't know everything. We need someone who knows a little bit more about following Jesus in this journey. And we need to actively seek out a mentor, someone who can pour into us as we intentionally pour into others. We learn from someone and invest in someone about following Jesus. They had an apprentice, someone they were discipling, a person that they were going to be very intentional with as they did the work. Don't miss that last part. Don't just breeze breeze through it. In everything the church did, everything the early church did, discipleship was always present. Okay, I think there's a few more pieces that we can learn from verses 6 through 12. So we're going to kind of take a big chunk. Up until this point, we've been going verse by verse, line by line. But I think uh, for your sake, for time's sake, we're going to just take a whole chunk of this together. So before we dive in, let me just say this. Um, If you're listening, say I am. Okay, we're ready. We can dive into this together. Buckle up. Verse 6, here we go. Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul had said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, this is that transition we talked about earlier where he's referred to as Paul now for the first time. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked the sorcerer in the eye, and then he said, You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, the enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. Okay, I know this is a lot. This is a big old chunk to read together. And some of you may be wondering, what in the world does this mean? I think 6 through 11 is showing us this. What do we see in Acts 13? The Holy Spirit strengthens and equips us in the face of opposition. The Holy Spirit sends us, but he also is our advocate. And he strengthens and he equips us in the face of opposition. You and I are going to face hardships. We're going to face attacks because of this. If you've answered the call of the Holy Spirit, 
He will be your advocate. He will strengthen and equip you to do the work that he set before you. A friend of mine uh, recently reminded me of something. I was in the middle of a conversation, kind of uh, woe is me story, you know. I'm kind of complaining. I'm like, man, why it, why it shouldn't be this hard? Why is it so difficult right now? Wrestling with self-doubt and, to be honest, kind of wallowing in a little bit of self-pity. And then I get this text out of nowhere that reminds me of this. It says, the anointing and suffering are inseparable. The anointing and suffering are inseparable. And it was like a shot to the heart when I got it. It is supposed to be difficult. Why I, I, I wrestle with why we believe sometimes that it's supposed to just be easy. That was never what we saw with the life of Jesus. Jesus was perfect. He lived a sinless life, and he was crucified. He was killed. It's not supposed to be easy. We're called to live a set-apart life. It's not easy to live a set-apart life in our world. We are called to do things differently, to engage with our family differently, to respond to our coworkers differently, to not get so mad in traffic when we got cut off, to maybe take the slow line so that somebody else has an opportunity to get to where they need to go faster. We're called to live a set-apart life, and that is not an easy thing. The reality is that when you step into this journey, you will have some really difficult times. I've had some difficult times in my life, hard to get through. Lost my mother when I was 15. We had some cancer scares with my wife when she was pregnant with our second kid. We've had some really hard times. But I want to remind you of this. Jesus said in John 16, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. The work set before us is hard, but you and I have an advocate. Jesus has gone through everything we're going through, and he's overcome it. That's the good news for us. It's not on us to do. Final verse for today is verse 12. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. You and I have found ourselves in this place, good or bad, not because of people. Our, our, our war is not with flesh and blood. So good or bad, we found ourselves in this place not because of people, but because of the work of the Holy Spirit in and through people, and because of God calling his people to himself. This is why we find ourselves here. That's good news for me. What do we see in Acts 13? God transforms people. God transforms people. He saves us. He calls us into service. He saturates us with the good news of the gospel. And then from our worship of him, he sends us on mission. I hear God renewing in me a heart of worship. I hear God saying, you've been wrestling with what are you supposed to do? What should this look like? What is the ministry you lead? What's the culture, the community you're trying to create in your worship team? What is that supposed to look like? What are we trying to lead people to in, in, uh, in church? I hear him saying, if you want to know all that, the answer is in blessing me. If you will spend some time blessing me, ministering to me, get alone if you have to, devote some intentional time thinking only of me. Worship is not about you, it's about me. I hear him convicting me of that and him saying, if I, if I will do that, if I will prioritize that, he's going to speak to me. He's going to let me know. And he's going to speak in a very clear voice so that I know where he's leading me to where I need to be. That's how God's challenging me. How's he challenging you today? For some of us, maybe he's challenging you that you need some diversity in your life. You need some new perspectives. You, maybe you need to invite someone in the mix that doesn't look like you, doesn't think like you, doesn't act like you, didn't come from where you come from to kind of shake up things, to provide a new perspective so that God can speak through that. Maybe for some of us, we need to live a, more, a little more like this. Just like we talked about in our recentering time together. God, would you help us be generous people? Maybe that's for some of us. Maybe for some of us, we've got this worship and mission thing backwards. We start with mission. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And hope that our worship fuels that. But we've got it backwards. 
we got to start with, God, who do you want me to be? I want to be like you. I want to worship you. I want to focus on you. My worship is not about my circumstance. It's about you. Maybe that's something he's saying to you today. Maybe for others, he's challenging you. You don't have a mentor, and you need one. You don't have somebody who's helping you understand the things you don't know. And maybe for some, it's been far too long since you have poured into someone intentionally. And you need to find someone. Maybe God's put right in your mind today, that person you need to reach out to and and mentor. Maybe these are some of the things he's saying to you. As always, we're going to have our response team down front. They're going to come down. And uh, these guys are available to you. This is, this is for prayer, right? This is for a time to wrestle with what God is, is saying to you. Maybe for some, you need prayer over something that's going on in your life, um, something really hard that's happening, and you just need some encouragement, someone to kind of go to bat for you in prayer. Maybe for some, this is the first time you're kind of hearing God prompting you, nudging you, kind of poking you, saying, it's time to come to me. And you want to trust Jesus for the first time. You want to trust Christ for the first time today. Maybe that's what he's saying to you. Maybe for some, you're like, I need to know what does it look like to be involved. I need to move from being a saved person to being a serving person. I need to get involved, engage in what's, what's happening. I can do some stuff. I, I need to bless my community and my, and my local church family. Maybe for some, you want to know what the next steps look like for baptism. We have a baptism class right after this service. Take some time and come down front. My challenge to you, my hard challenge to you is don't walk out of here today carrying something you know deep down you should have had a conversation about. Don't walk out of here carrying that. Come down, let these guys answer some questions. Let them pray with you. Let them them join you on this journey together. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for speaking to us as as we gather today and we worship you. We ask, Father, that you identify some of the things that you've said to us today and you help us wrestle with what you want us to do about it. We pray, God, that as we move along this spiritual, natural spiritual growth, God, that you would help us increasingly pattern our life after your son Jesus. And because of that, as a result of that, help us as the church continue the rhythms and patterns that we see in the early church and to hold on to those things. We thank you for speaking to us. We know that when we worship you and we focus on you, you meet us there. You're not hiding behind some curtain somewhere. You're ready and available when we come to you. So, Father, we thank you for that. We love you. We thank you for the day. It's in your name we pray and everyone said, amen. God bless you. Thanks so much. See you next week.